I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So in June of 2005, I found myself at a crossroad. I was newly married and living in uh, a foreign land, Lansing, Michigan, <laughs> also known as the Great White North, because anything above Florida that gets snow is just too cold for me. My wife and I, Carrie, had just gotten married. We went on our honeymoon. We got back, and I was working part-time at a church, a large church, one of many staff within the youth ministry department, and they called our whole department in and let us know that we no longer had jobs. The youth pastor had resigned and was moving back to Florida, um, and the team that he had brought in was no longer going to be able to, to stay on staff with him not being there. So I found myself at a crossroad. I had my associate's degree, I was newly married, and I didn't know what to do. So I began to pray. And I asked God, God, would you kind of reveal to me and Carrie where you want us to be? And I kind of felt this sense and this peace come over me. And I applied to go and finish my bachelor's degree uh, at Indiana Wesleyan. It was actually the college that just before uh, we got married that my wife graduated from. So she already had a degree from Indiana Wesleyan, and I applied and went down. And I remember interviewing at the college, um, and I slept on the couch of the vice president of the college's home, like I stayed at his house, slept on the couch, interviewed with him, which was weird, and you know, got accepted in. So January, we moved, January 2006, we moved everything we had to Indiana. And I started college, and I, I began studying uh, youth ministry and biblical literature. That's what my bachelor's degree is in. And as I was nearing graduation two and a half years later, which should have only been two years, two and a half years later, you know, college, I found myself again praying, God, I'm at a crossroad. Where do you want our family to go? And I was interviewing at uh, about three different churches, and it really got down to about two different churches, and then all of a sudden, one church I didn't hear from. And it's, it's funny because that church that I was interviewing with back in late 2008 that I never heard back from, their pastor and I are now actually really good friends, just small world. But I didn't take that job, obviously. I, I took another job in a small community of Glen Ellen, Illinois. Anybody ever heard of Glen Ellen, Illinois? It is uh, the next town over from Wheaton. Anybody ever heard of Wheaton College? Wheaton College is one of the largest uh, evangelical colleges in the nation. And it is a hub of Christian uh, scholar, scholarly writing and um, scholasticism or whatever the word that I can't get out of my mouth is right now, but Wheaton is a really famous and well-known place. So I take this job in Glen Ellen and I begin to spend time in Wheaton. They have uh, a library there that was beautiful and great resources, so I would actually go when I was working in Glen Ellen to Wheaton. And I began to learn about the history of Wheaton College. Anybody ever read Time Magazine? All right, so got a few people who know what that is. 
Uh, second question, you don't need to date yourself, but was anybody around in 1950? <laughs> a couple of you, I, I wasn't. Um, wasn't even a glimmer in my parents' eye yet, so. Uh, February 20th, 1950. Something amazing happened at Wheaton. They call it the 42 Hours of Repentance. Time Magazine writes this story about how the balding, spectacled President Victor Raymond Edmund of Illinois' Wheaton College began uh, the regular season by having a session during his evangelistic week that tr traditionally was taking place at the beginning of the term year. He steps to the microphone in the auditorium they describe as this rectangular auditorium at Pierce Memorial Chapel. I've been around their campus and it's beautiful. When you pull in from Glen Ellen into Wheaton, you pass by all the sports fields and then you see uh, the rest of the campus and there is this beautiful chapel that is there. And then there is the C.S. Lewis uh, Research Center. There's the Billy Graham Evangelistic Center. But this little chapel, this rectangular chapel, this particular day, February 20th, 1950, the president of the college steps up to the microphone to begin a time of prayer, and he does something that was typical, but usually was never met with the response that he had on that one particular day. He would invite people to come up and give kind of, let's call them a glory sighting, or share a word, give a testimony, like what's going on in your life? And one particular student gets up and they begin to ask for forgiveness. They ask God, they begin to repent this idea of repentance is recognizing that there is sin in your life. You see the sin and you turn around and you move in the opposite direction away from sin. I recognize I've done wrong. God, forgive me of my wrong and help me to move in the other direction. February 20th, 1950 was the day of the Wheaton College Revival. For 42 hours, people came to the microphone. They confessed sin. They prayed prayers. They sang songs, and the Spirit of God descended on that place, and a movement of God took place. Because when the Spirit shows up, something amazing is going to happen. Throughout history, we can see different revivals. We see the first and the second Great Awakenings here. Uh, in our country taking place under the leadership of preachers like Jonathan Edwards and uh, revivalists prior to that taking place with John Wesley. 500 years ago, there was a reformation. The Spirit of God showed up and something amazing happened. I share this story of Wheaton College because it hits home to me. I remember being there and having an opportunity to sit with others and pray. And I was there in 2012 at the library researching as I had just got accepted into Asbury and began asking the question of God, here I am again at a crossroad. At Wheaton College, of all places, where revival had fallen because when the Spirit of God shows up, something amazing happens. And I was there praying, asking God for direction at this crossroad, which would eventually lead to me moving my entire family to Claremont, Florida, where for nine years I served in ministry before being called here to serve as pastor. When the Spirit of God shows up, something amazing happens. When the Spirit descends, revival takes place. Reformation happens. Lives are changed. Communities are shaped. The world is impressed upon by the grace and the majesty of Jesus. When the Spirit shows up, something amazing happens. And that's where we turn our attention this morning. As we've been walking through this series, in week one, we talked about credo, the idea of belief that you and I all have belief. We all have faith. 
And our faith is only as strong as the object in which it is placed. If our faith is in shifting sand, our house will always falter. But if our faith is, in, is upon the solid rock, no matter when the wind and rain comes, we will not be blown over. So we said that not only do we have belief, but we said in week two that our belief is directed towards God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Week three, we took a pause and talked about a little bit of resurrection in this season of Easter. And last week, we continued with the belief in Christ the Son. So this morning, we turn our attention to what it means to say that we have belief in God, the Holy Spirit. So let's pray, and then let's dive into the Word this morning. Lord, it is my prayer that for each and for every one of us who maybe today is standing at a crossroad, that God, you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that you would remind us that you dwell within us, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive the beauty and the majesty of the love that you have for us, reminding us that there is no breath, nor depth, nor width, nor height that could ever separate us from the love that you have for us. So be with us this morning as we begin to unpack the ever-present reality of the Holy Spirit. So Father, we thank you, for it is in your name we pray. And everybody said? So we're going to turn our attention to the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to actually skip Corinthians. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But we're going to start with Acts. So we are in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, and then we'll skip over to chapter 2. But in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, we see these words to us about the Holy Spirit. It says, hold on. I was in the wrong book. It's all good. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 says, And while staying with them, this is Jesus staying with his disciples, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So God makes his disciples a promise. And he says, I want you to wait right here. And here's the promise that you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus responds to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but verse 8, and this is important, church family, but you, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Let's jump forward to chapter 2. Here, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, Pentecost was uh, about 40 days or so after the resurrection of Jesus. When Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, as Jesus had commanded them. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then over to Romans, next book after Acts, Romans 15, it says this, that when the Spirit shows up, Paul says, may God... May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. When the Spirit arrives, hope accompanies. When the Spirit arrives, joy accompanies. When the Spirit arrives, peace 
accompanies. So we find here in Acts, Luke is telling us about the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives a promise to his disciples. He says, listen, there's going to come a moment where I am going to depart. It's the reality. I must die. I must die. But after me will come one who will be your helper, who will be your companion, who will be with you perpetually, who will always be present, who will always look after you, who will always care for you, who will always be there with you. After me, I am sending to you the helper. This is the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? We as Christians, and we've talked about this throughout the series, I'm going to use some big terms, so track with me, don't be intimidated. We as Christians are Trinitarian. We believe in one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have always existed in relationship, perfect harmony with one another. They are three persons, one God. The closest analogy I could think of that we could see in nature today is that of water. It is one substance that exists in three uh, states, right? You have a solid that is ice. If you leave that ice out for too long, it melts and turns into a liquid. And then if you superheat that liquid, it turns into a gas with steam. It is one substance in three states. We have one God and three persons. But there is a teaching that's even prevalent today amongst some of our other Christian denominations that teach this idea of modalism. That there is the Father, that there is the Son, but there is no Spirit. This is a heretical teaching. Because we are not modalists, we are Trinitarian. There is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So who is this Holy Spirit? Well, one of the early church fathers uh, by the name of Gregory Nazinaz, that's a cool name though, right? I, I hope I said that right. He said this. Let me read this to us. God, the Holy Spirit, has always existed. And He exists and always will exist. The Holy Spirit neither has beginning nor will He have an end. The Spirit is being partaken but not partaking, perfecting but not perfected, sanctifying but not being sanctified, deifying not being deified, life and life giver, light and light giver, absolute good and spring of goodness, by whom the Father is known and the Son is glorified. The Holy Spirit has always existed. There has never been a moment in all of history, or even prehistory, where the Spirit of God has not existed. He has always existed, is existing, and will always one day exist. There is no beginning, and there is no end. I love the idea that He is perfecting, not being perfected. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit in our life is that He draws us close to God and perfects us in faith. So let me ask you this question, church. Um, whether you are the youngest disciple in the room or the oldest disciple in the room, are you perfect? Who's closest to perfection? Ah, that's a trick question. Trick question. Depends on how old you are. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> oldest person in the room, most perfect. No, like, listen. The idea of the Holy Spirit working in us is that every day the Spirit is perfecting us in faith so that day by day we are becoming more and more faithful. But none of us has fully arrived. 
I think one of the travesties of the Christian church today is this idea that in order to come in, some people think that they have to be perfect or sinless or give up on things or stop doing things or start acting a certain way in order to come to church. They think that they have to be perfect in order to enter the church, but the reality is, is that God is in the process through the Holy Spirit of perfecting us. So nobody comes in perfect, but we become more perfected in faith. Does that, that make sense? Like, you don't need to have your stuff together to go to church. You don't need to be all together, all with it, dressed fancy, looking good, hair done, clothes sharp. You don't need to have that attitude to come into church because the idea is that you come into here you worship among the family. You connect in a living relationship with the living God and you become perfected in the process. So you don't arrive fully arrived. It is a journey that we are on together with one another that God is leading and we are being perfected in the process. Additionally, it says that we are being sanctified. Sanctification is this idea of grace that God gives us that helps us to die to sin daily to live for Jesus more. When I was a youth pastor, I used to say it this way. I said it was less of me and more of JC. The idea of sanctification is that when people look at our lives, they see less of the self-centered, selfish, egotistical individuals that the world tends to shape us into being, and they start to see more of Christ's love and hope and faith and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. That's the things that mark us so that we become more fruitful and faithful in those regards. When people look at us as Christians, they should see the sanctification taking place within our life. So church, when people look at you, do they see the evidence of the Spirit in your life? Do they see the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit marking your life? A few months ago, we talked through the fruit of the Spirit, that it is love and joy and peace and patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that those elements are uh, evident of the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We become more faithful and fruitful in those the more sanctified we become. Just this big churchy term that means less of me, more of JC, more of Jesus being evident in our lives. So this is what Gregory says of the Holy Spirit. We also know, as we've talked about the Father and the Son, that if the Holy Spirit is God, then the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent, all-present, always with us. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. The Scriptures talk about the Holy Spirit as being personal, it is, uh, the Holy Spirit is never referred to as it, but always in personal terms as he or spirit. It's so not an inanimate abject. It's not a, a uh, force that cannot be understood or interacted with, but the Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. It's of the one same essence with the Father and is to be worshipped as true God. This is who the Holy Spirit is. And for many of us, though, like if you come from a Methodist Wesleyan background, we tend to talk about the Spirit more, but I think about my friends who are in like Baptist churches or Presbyterian churches. There are some denominations, and not all of those churches, but some of them, that have a, I'm going to choose my words correctly, not necessarily a lower view, but they don't talk about the Holy Spirit as much as they tend to talk about the Son or, or the Father. There are some churches that, that get a little scared of the presence of the Holy Spirit because we have Pentecostals. Out of this, um, I, I made re reference to this Wheaton revival, but prior to that in the early 1900s was the Azusa Street revival that took place that would eventually lead to the Wheaton revival, but the Azusa Street revival is what led to the charismatic and Pentecostal movement out of the holiness movement. That is our Wesleyan Methodism. We are the crazy cousins of the, of the charismatics, all right? Or there are they're, they're our crazy cousins. Somewhere in there, we're family. But in some traditions, they get a little 
reserved about the Holy Spirit, but the reality is that the Spirit is the ever presence of God in your life. So let's, let's dig a little deeper. If that's who the Spirit is, and Scriptures um, tend to, when it comes to God, not only talk about who God is, but what God does, this is what the Holy Spirit does. I've got a dozen or so things that we're going to roll through real quick. The first thing that we see is that the Holy Spirit is drawing. The Spirit draws us to Himself when we are lost. Have you ever had that conviction within your heart? That, that heart strangely warm? That whisper in your ear when you are far from God? It's the Spirit drawing you close. The Spirit also convicts the world convicts you and I of sin. That when there is sin that is prevalent in our lives, when we feel bad about sin, we feel guilty about sin, it is the Spirit who convicts us of sin. Again, as we have talked, let me remind that sin is doing what we should not do, but it is also not doing the things we should. Sin is not not measuring up to the standard that God has set for our lives. So the Spirit is drawing, the Spirit is convicting, the Spirit is also igniting faith. The Spirit gives us the power to believe in God. John Wesley called this provenient grace. That we in ourselves and of ourselves don't even have the ability to have faith, but God gives us the grace we need to ignite faith within our lives. But not only does the Spirit ignite faith, the Spirit integrates faith. It integrates faith into all areas of our life. It's like a bike spoke. It's the centrality of our life. And those little spokes, those little things on a bike that go to the outer rim, they touch everything. And if God is central to our lives, He should touch and be involved in every area of your life. So let let me get on my preacher's soapbox for just a quick second. Is there an area in your life that you're holding God back from? If there is, today is the day you need to invite the Holy Spirit in. The Holy Spirit who is ever present in your life is integrating faith, bringing faith into every area of your life. Every area that you let Him in. And today may be the day you need to let Him into some areas of your life. Maybe into your ego, pride, into your finances, into your family into that secret sin that you keep hidden that nobody knows but you and God. If He's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, He already knows it. He's already seen it. And He's also all-powerful to help you overcome it. The Holy Spirit is cleansing that when sin is present, it is the Spirit who cleanses us of all unrighteousness. The Spirit is healing, healing our wounds, The Spirit fills us with all spiritual grace. The Spirit is filling. The Spirit is also stirring, eliciting faith, hope, and love. The Spirit is indwelling. That when you confess Christ as Lord, you believe in your hearts that He has died. You've confessed with your mouth that He has died. And you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. Then God seals you with the promised Holy Spirit in Ephesians. And we'll get to that in just a moment. The Spirit is indwelling at the moment of conversion. It's that idea of being baptized in the Spirit. The Spirit is also comforting. Binds up the broken and soothes the soul. The Spirit is life-giving. Raises us from the dead to give us life. The Spirit is guiding. The Spirit leads us from today into tomorrow. The Spirit is teaching. Invisibly leading us into all truth. The Spirit is listening. The Spirit hears every prayer and praise. The Spirit is coaching helping you and I to live for God. And finally, the Spirit is healing. For the Spirit heals the whole history of sin. The Holy Spirit is the ever-present reality of God in your life. 
So imagine this. I think of what the old patristic fathers said. I can't remember if it was Augustine or Aquinas or one of the early church fathers who equated the human heart to being the throne of God. Imagine your heart as being the, the throne upon which God sits. Can you picture it? Can you see that red heart-shaped chair right there? And could you imagine God coming from heaven and dwelling within your life and sitting upon the throne of your heart? That as your heart beats, God is present. There are moments where we sometimes want to kick God off the throne seat so that we can sit there. And the Spirit, who is a gentleman, steps to the side and says, I'll wait. We'll see how you do. How's it going? You got this? Are you sure? I can help. You got this. How did, it, how did it turn out? It didn't turn out so well. You know, I can help lead, right? I can be present. I can guide. I can direct. I can give strength. I can give hope. I can elicit faith. I can give wisdom. I can give knowledge. But you got to invite me back on to the throne that is your heart. God desires to rest upon the throne of your heart. So in Ephesians, we see this. I want to leave us with two things before we transition into a time of communion. If this is who the Spirit is and this is what the Spirit does, why should any of this matter to us? Well, there's two things that I, I want us to hear. The reason this matters is because first, the Holy Spirit seals our salvation. The Holy Spirit seals our salvation. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. I don't, I don't think this is going to be on the screen, but listen. It says this, In Christ you have also, when you heard the word of truth, that is the gospel of your salvation, you believed in Him. And when you believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glorious grace. You see, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, God sends the Holy Spirit into your life to seal you for salvation. It is the mark that God is present. The Spirit comes in. He sees your heart. He gets a broom. He starts to sweep things out. He sees some sin. He convicts us of sin. He says, you shouldn't have this. He gives us the power to fight the temptation, to overcome the sin, to be perfected and sanctified in Christ so that we might look as different individuals. The Spirit is present, but He seals us. That means the Spirit of God dwells within your heart right now. If you are in Christ, the Spirit is within you. If you are in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within you. He rests upon your throned heart and says, I am present. I am here. I am with you. I am for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am present. He seals you for salvation. So for those of us who are in Christ, we have been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our internal inheritance. If you are in Christ, the Spirit is within you, sealing you, marking you, telling the world that God is with you. First, so second, first the Spirit seals us for salvation. Second, the Spirit connects us to the church. So, if we have been saved from something, we've been saved from sin, that means we've also been saved to something. We've been saved to community. Church is very important because we were created in such a way that we were not meant to be alone. And the church is where we connect with one another and we go and grow through life together. It's the Spirit who empowers each of us for the common good with all spiritual gifts to be a blessing within the local church. We find this in 1 Corinthians 12, but I'm actually going to skip that. You can go read that later. We're running a little, little uh, low on time. But it's the Spirit 
that connects us to the local church. You have been sealed in the Spirit and you have been connected. You have been saved from sin and you've been saved to community. And the beautiful thing is, is as the Spirit dwells within, the Spirit stirs our affections. Not only for God, but for one another. So church, this morning, here's my encouragement to us. As we've looked at faith, in particular in the Father and in the Son, may our faith in the Spirit remind us that God is ever present with us. That He strengthens us, that He guides us, that He protects us, that He stirs faith, that He heals wounds, that He forgives sins, that He gives life, that He teaches and listens and coaches and guides. But most importantly, that the Spirit dwells within. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as we turn our mind and our attention to the Holy Spirit, the ever-present reality that You are with us, God, remind us today, convict us today, that we would be reminded that You are always with us, that You are always for us, that You are guiding us, that You are protecting us, that you are forgiving sins, you are healing wounds, and you are sealing us up for the day of resurrection. So Holy Spirit, we pray this morning for your peace and for your grace, for your hope and for your love to overwhelm us as we invite you to sit upon the throne of our hearts, to take up residence, to reveal sin, to convict, not to condemn, but to show compassion and to show grace as you remind us that in Christ we are forgiven. So forgive our sins, heal our wounds, and make us new in Christ as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.